Luckily, before I died, my wife insisted that I sort out who was going to rule after I died. So now my bloodline runs through mankind forevermore. Plus my grandson, Kublai Khan, gets to rule China and show off all of China's greatness to Marco Polo. Then I heard Marco went back to Italy and got thrown in prison with a ghostwriter whose autobiography had to be published as fiction because no one would believe the numbers. Welcome, everybody. This is a humorous history podcast, and we are the Goofy Historians. We don't have a drum roll this time. I got to I got to work on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Mongols again. Last time we kind of had part one. And what that was is we talked about Timogen becoming Genghis Khan. And we talked about how Genghis Khan then consolidated all the steppe people in the, you know, in the Eurasic, Eurasic steppe. And it was a great video. And you have to be sure if you didn't watch that, go, go back and watch that. And the Mongols only got one name, you know, like one name for me, one name for you, one name for everybody. Like but Madonna? Very tribe, huh? Like Madonna? I thought Madonna. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Like Madonna or Prince. Yeah, that was it. Uh, they, but like, unlike Prince, they didn't even have little symbols. They had just one name. Um, now, you would think chronologically we would be doing part two right now. Um, part two is when the Mongols go west and they face up against persian arabic turkic russian and european folks but that's going to be recorded later in this month because we have a special guest um his name is ali and he's going to be our guest speaker for that show which we're going to record later in the month so actually this show if you will is part three we're doing part three before we do part two and part three is what we're going to do today is probably the best part because let's back up just a, just a second so when genghis khan had everything consolidated in the steppe all across this huge land mass and he had all these armies he probably came to realize that he probably had the best army on the face of the earth that ever had existed the, the way they worked together and their horses and all of that. The problem was, is that once everything was consolidated and you didn't have anybody to fight, what was going to happen is that they were going to end up fighting themselves and it was all going to fall apart. So looking to China, that was a no brainer because since the Han dynasty, the that people of that area have been fighting China. So what we're going to talk today about is um, so that so the Mongols needed to stop fighting themselves. So what they ended up doing was fighting in China, the Song and the Jin dynasty. And we're going to talk about how that happened. And then at the very end, which is crazy fascinating, is we're going to get to Kublai Khan and we're going to get to Marco Polo. And we're going to discover why Marco po and figure out why like little kids in a pool play that game, Marco Polo. Actually, we're not going to figure that out. We still don't know. Um, but anyway, Marco Polo became a government official in the Mongol um, empire before he went back to Venice. And then he wrote that book and nobody believed him. Now, prior, just prior to that, um, they actually gets to a point where they bring back the imperial exams so we're in up going to end up going full circle in a sense if you watch some of our other episodes on the taiping rebellion we talked about the imperial exams so anyway let's get started joseph is going to joseph knows so much about this chinese dynasty so i is it the song or the gen that came first <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, let's even back up before that. So, as you know, there's the the the, the uh, steppe, the Great Plateau that ranges from Siberia and the, the Pacific Oceans all the way to Hungary, right? 
and then there's North and South China. Now there's a clear distinction between North and South China. If you're taking a plane from Beijing to Guangzhou, right, and you're looking out the window, you can actually see when South China begins. North China is like part of the step, right? It, it is. There's no clear distinction between where the Mongols start or stop and the China proper begins. And that's why you have the Great Wall. There's no natural break, right? So the China had to put a line and say, "Okay, you guys up there, the barbarians, be on this line. We're we're the civilized country." Going further south, you get out of that plate plain, beyond the on the other side of the the, the Yangtze River, everything becomes green and mountainy and rainy. You get something like you think of Vietnam. It becomes very tro tropical and wet, and there's grass and there's there's uh, these fields full of rice, which is rice paddies. It's all water, right? So that is hard for the Mongols to deal with. They can deal with just coming over the Great Wall, right? Because you're still in the steppes, basically, right? So there's there's sort of always been a tension or a division in China between the North and the South. And I just want to say that because at the beginning of the Song Dynasty, they did control all of the all of North and South China, right? But they couldn't hold on to it. What happened was the the Jurchen were people who are basically the same people who are going to be the Manchu people later. They're they're step people themselves. They come down and they conquer half of China. When they called it the Jin Dynasty, right? So they're not Chinese. And there's another one called Xixia, which is people from Tibet. They're down there for some reason and they're ruling. And the Song Dynasty are now pushed all the way south, right? And the Jin do become sinitized. They they speak Chinese. They they want to outdo the Chinese in being Chinese. They're like, I'm more Chinese than thou, sort of, right? Because they're like sort of making up for their barbarian ancestors, right? So they're they're competing and they're like have silk and porcelain and poppy seeds and everything. But the Song and the Jin are have are still technically at war with each other, but they've been at war with each other for years. And you get the sense that no one really wants to They've, they've come to this uneasy truce with each other and they're not in open, open warfare each other. Like one of them sends an army out, you know, during the, the, the season of battle, but basically they're like enemies, but they're living with each other. So that, that's, the, that's, the, that's what happens when Genghis Khan finally comes in and, and, and is going to fight the Chinese. He's not fighting the Chinese. He's fighting the Jurchen. He's fighting what will be the Manchu later, right? Um, and he, he does. He comes down there and he, he, he's, he's fighting the Manchu and in the Shishia he takes first and he uses the Shishia to fight the Manchu or the, the Jurchens. And, and then he gets distracted and he goes over to East Asia. He gets all this wealth and he goes over to uh, to to not not to East Asia the what is it the, he goes west in, into Persia for a long time. Can I chime yeah. in for just a second? Yeah, sure, so, sure, sure. Please, or I'll when, ramble. When did the uh, but the China had built a great wall to keep him out? Did he just go over the wall, or did he go under the wall? Well, remember the. <laughs> There was technically a great wall during that time, but it hadn't been maintained. And the Manchu, well, the Jurchen, right, didn't care about a great wall. They lived right in the middle of it, right? So it went, went like right through their territory. So it wasn't very meaningful for anybody. And that's probably why when, uh, uh, and then when obviously the Mongols came down and took all of China, the, the great wall was right, went right through the middle of their territory. So it wasn't like, dividing anybody anymore uh and that if anything it was kind of an embarrassment right so that, that's probably so um marco polo when he went back to china never mentions the great wall ah. right and so i mean and you can see why the mongols aren't going to say well here's a great wall that uh, you know they they were trying to keep us out it was like in, in disrepair and pretty much neglected at that point so yeah, you, you've been to you've been to China a bunch of times. Did you ever make it to the Great Wall? 
Yeah, I've been many, many times on the Great Wall. Yeah, I, I've been to the touristy parts of the Great Wall, what they maintain for the tourists, which is like probably maybe what it actually looked like. But it's good to get away and actually see like the remnants of the Great Wall, right? Where they haven't been maintained for it's like 300 years and it's like falling apart and it's dangerous, but it's it's cool and it's dramatic, right? Because you get a sense of actually the history of it, as opposed to like the maintained Great Wall with, you know, you know little soldiers marching around and stuff but uh, both are both are very very amazing right but you have to know which side is the barbarian side and which side is the civilized side because there's no difference right it's kind of like arbitrarily put in there right so the the mongols do come down and first they fight the jurchens oh oh it's funny right so the jurchens so the Georgians, the Georgians, the, the Jin dynasty is being attacked by the Mongols. And they go down to the song and they say, you know, we've been having this little squabble for like years, right? And it's like civilized people fighting each other. And like we fight and then we go have tea and then we fight and then we go make some soap. But these Mongols, they're different. They're different. We, the Jin and the song, and the Shia, we have to get together, really. Forget about, we'll go back to squabbling later, but if we don't take care of the Mongols, we're both going to be destroyed. And the song goes, well, sure, you're saying that now, right? So the Mongols, the song actually goes to Genghis Khan and say, yeah, we'll, we'll help you take this guy out because you're going to take this guy out. And then we're going we're gonna to go and take everybody again, right? And the Jinn are, the Jinn are going, that's not going to happen, guys. You're, you're just going to be destroyed. So they do, the Mongols do come down and take the, the Jinn, right? And it didn't exhaust the Mongols. They were still ready to go. Um, so after they took the Jinn and the Shia, they came down through Shishuan and then crossed over and came underneath and took out the, 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 the Song, the, the Song Dynasty. And what I think is interesting is that the Song and the Mongols are probably the most different group of people who could ever come face to face with each other on the battlefield. I mean, like you said, the Song is the they've been they've been having the the imperial exams right ever since the Han. They, they all they do is like they're scholars, right? They're scholars, aristocrats. I mean. Uh, they're gentlemen. They, they write poetry. They're hyper, hyper literate, right? If you see in the Chinese language, it's not only the written language or the spoken language, it's how you write it. They have calligraphy and art and poetry and opium and beautiful women. It's like, and then you have the Mongols, right? Who, who don't write or read anything. They have no literature, right? All they do is like ride ponies. I mean, from the point they're, you know, from the point where they're born right there they're 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 come out of their mother's womb and they're put on a pony right and then all they do is like and they kill animals and they hunt and they can stay on a horse for weeks at a time and when they're crossing the step they eat their horse they stick a straw in the horse and suck out blood in order to eat um no poetry well actually they do have poetry in the terms of like because that, since they don't have a written language, they have to remember messages, so they put it in rhyme, right? So they're like they have little rhymed couplets to to send messages and stuff. But very different. Uh, talk about a clash of cultures, right? Which is which is it was very like the it's like the illiterati versus and the illiterati, <laughs> that, right? Literati versus illiterati. Who happens to yeah. who happens to look like uh, one of those? Um, worldwide wrestling guys you know yeah <laughs> yeah but and 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 the uh i gotta mention about the song dynasty because they were like the elite culture of the world at that time point right i mean they, they were probably even years ahead of the persian empire right they had paper money they had um they had um diversified their economy right? These are the first people who said, well, we don't need to make rice, you know, in order to live. We're just going to make tea. Like, let's just, just focus on tea, right? And someone else says, well, let's just make it, let's just work on ceramics, right? Just, we're just going to do ceramics, right? And someone else goes, you know, I'm not going to try to do subsistence farming. I'm just going to do silk, 
I'm going to specialize in silk and my silk, someone else says, I'm just going to do poppies, right? So they had this massively like, diversified economy with the paper money and their, they had coinage that was used throughout Asia, Japan and Malaysia, they all used Chinese money. Um, and they had, it was the first time they started creating art for art's sake. This is the first time in the history of humans, we have named artists, right? Artists weren't like just a job, right? Where you painted like mosaics on a wall for somebody. You had art for art's sakes and people were famous for being artists per se. They had names like a Michelangelo or Da Vinci, you know, that, you know, Europe got like in the 1450s and the 1600s. Um, they had mathematicians, they had science, they had engineering, right? All of this stuff, it, it was the industrial revolution, right? It was the industrial revolution 600 years before the industrial revolution. And the Mongols just put an end to it, right? It's like, what, where would we have been, right? In the world, if they had let poor, the poor little Song, Song empire, you know, continue on its way to create a truly, you know, industrial revolutions with this underlying, you know, artistic and, and um, you know, art and science, you know, it was a collaboration, but it, it didn't. So, but, but they did have engineering. So they did, it took the Mongols with their ponies 65 years to conquer Song, China. So there is that too. And they didn't do it by themselves. They could only do it because they had already conquered Persia, right? So per, they had to get Muslim is the, the the Muslims engineers to say, "You guys come down because we don't we're we're in Song China. It's wet down here, right? We our 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 long bows our our composite bows aren't working down here because it's too wet, and we we don't know we can work on the plains. We can't work in valley river valleys, so they hired the the Muslims to come down and help them conquer China. And the Islamic empire was very advanced too. They had engineers and they, the, the engineers, they finally brought some, these two brothers uh, from Iraq who had like, who created like 60 foot long trebuchets um, that, that could, so they finally conquered Southern China through the technology of a third country. And that then, and they, 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 they did, they finally uh, conquered, conquered Song, Song, Song China. That's so cool. But my favorite character, even before I started looking at this was um, Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan. Yeah, Kublai you... Khan is the one who finally did it. Yeah, it was all, it was all under Kublai Khan that it was, uh, so the song, the the, the 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 song empire, and basically the end of the Jin empire was was conquered under Kublai Khan. Yeah, and so he, what was, he, he, yeah. What, what was crazy is that um, just recently I was glancing through the Netflix stuff, and there was a Marco Polo thing, and I was clicked on that, and uh, you know Netflix is Netflix, but it reminded me of of where we're at today because. At that point, when Kublai Khan was had, you know, control over all of China, it was a pretty safe place because if it wasn't, Marco Polo would have never been able to get that far. Well, actually, Marco Polo's father went first, but that whole road would have never been safe enough for him to travel. And then Marco Polo, he was kind of young when he gets to um, Kublai Khan. And Kublai Khan is like, this dude's cool. And he keeps him as a guest for 20 years. And he gives him, eventually he be, uh, Marco Polo becomes a, I don't know what you could say, but a governmental high official. In yeah, the... yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I talk about that for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, because so another interesting about Kublai Khan, I mean, he was, he knew what he didn't know right which is a lot of managers don't right and so just as he conquered china by bringing in engineers when he faced the chinese engineers he goes i i can't fight chinese engineers i don't know anything about engineers right they're gonna like silicon valley taking on somebody else right eventually silicon silicon valley is gonna win not because we're armed right now but when we do get armed we're gonna beat you 
right? So then, so can, so he goes to the Persians and he says, I, I, I know you guys know about trebuchets. Come down here and let, let's combine our forces, our ponies and your trebuchets, and we'll, we'll take the, the Song Dynasty. And they did. But then after he conquered China, he goes, I don't, I have, I don't know anything about the imperial exams, right? I, I can't even read Mongolian, much less, you know, mm-hmm. sit for the imperial exams. So what he does, he he doesn't trust the uh, the Chinese literati, right? With all their, because this is song, so their poetry is like super complex, right? They're like everything's nuanced, right? And one thing the Mongols don't have is nuance, right? They have no concept of nuance or irony or any of that. It's just, you know, here's the sword, there's the water, get baptized. Um, so he doesn't trust the Chinese literati, so he hires a subgroup of people, to, like a, a layer of bureaucracy of people he's already conquered, right? Mainly the Persians, the Turks, the Christians, the Jews, he comes, brings them in as an administrative administrative substrata between him and the Chinese. And that's where, and they're called, actually they're called the uh, Simurin, which means the colored eyed people, right? Because they're, they're like the Mongols have brown eyes, the Chinese have brown eyes, and you get uh, Marco Polo showing up with blue eyes. So Marco Polo is one of these strata between the Chinese and the Mongols who's supposed to administrate the industry, right? I mean, the problem with the Mongols is they didn't understand Chinese, right? And, but now you get this substrate who don't understand Chinese either. Right? It's like, it's just a sub, a substrata. So, but it, he, so he talks to Marco Polo type people and say, you deal with the Chinese, right? I'll deal with you because I already own you, right? I already, you know, I, I know you. So he, he uses the administrative people. So he legally divided China into three groups. One group was the Mongols who are the top, who are like 0.1% of the population, right? There's a hundred million, over a hundred million Chinese in China at that time. And there's like maybe 50,000 Mongols that have to rule the whole thing. So he brings in these, uh, so he subcontracted the administration of China, basically. He says, I'll, I'll control you, Marco Polo, but you guys go ahead and take care of the empire. And then they had to deal with the Chinese, right? So it was the Mongols and the Simurin, who was the colored eyed people, the Europeans and the Persians. And under them, the Han Chinese, who are like the Northern Chinese, who he could kind of relate with, right? They're like Han Chinese, they're they're from a flat, dry area. And then the very low were the non-Chinese, non-NAN, which means the Southern Chinese, which is everybody in the rice paddies, the, the, you know, the Cantonese, the Hakka, all these subgroups down down there were, 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 the, were, the very, were the very bottom. And that's how he tried to administrate the empire. That wasn't going to work very well, right? <laughs> you can't, you know, Marco Polo was probably okay, right? But I don't know, you know, it's, it's like eventually um, they, even though, even that substrata said, you know, it's the Chinese, it's their country. They're the ones who know how to run it. Right. So eventually, uh, Genghis Khan actually reinstituted the imperial exams. And I said, okay, you guys, you guys kind of help out with running the empire. Right? You, you mean Kublai Khan? Kublai Khan, yeah. 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 Kublai yeah what's Khan. so funny <laughs> is that um, uh, you, we, we always keep coming, well, I think we're going to keep coming back to um the important question of of what would have what would have happened um if there had been no mongols but when people in america hear the name marco polo it does it goes back to the when you were a kid in a swimming pool and there was a game called marco polo marco polo nobody knows how that originated you can ask anybody they have no idea I wonder what Wikipedia has to say. Yeah, and actually, after Marco Polo even left China, this is you don't hear about this. He was in China. He uh, supposedly 
they had actually made him the governor of Han uh, or the mayor or something of uh, Hangzhou, right? Which which was a capital city, right? For you know, Sibomen, Samarin, <laughs> right? To to, to control. Uh, a large part of China, and then they took him. They, they got him as an ambassador to go to um, India and Burma. So he actually took a ship all the way around India up to Burma to to drop off some princesses, right? That were used as dowry or something like. And uh, apparently, one of the princesses, the the, the prince, a uh, prince, princess, uh, fell in love with him on the way of dropping him off. And then he went all the way back, and then eventually back to Europe. So, that's, so when he got you know, there, what did he? What did he say? I'm Marco Polo. I'm Chinese, and they're like, uh, "No, you're not." <laughs> what was funny? I don't know. At that point, after 20 years, maybe he actually spoke. To, I don't know if he's learned. I bothered to learn Mongolian or Chinese, or would he learn? I mean, 20 years. I guess he was really good at languages. I mean, he spoke Italian and probably maybe he spoke. Mandarin and, and, and Mongolian. If he was, if he was so good at languages, though, why, why did he need a ghostwriter? Because when he got, when he finally did get back to Vienna, um, actually, he was, he was Geno Genoese. Um, no, he, 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 no, he was captured by the Gen Genoese. He, he, he was Venetian. Yeah. Well, they but, were having a but, war. But, they, they were yeah, having, they were having this little war, like this little war between Genoa and Venice, right? It's like. He just been through like Beijing and you know all these capitals. Uh, so he gets he gets back and he gets thrown in prison for a while, and he's in a cell with uh, this guy who ends up being a ghostwriter, and he writes down because Marco Polo is just telling about his adventures adventures for the last twenty years, <laughs> and uh, so when they finally get out, they publish it, and there were that book became known as A Million Lies because nobody yeah, cause believed it. <laughs> yeah i mean and, and and you know they were probably as well if you were in china why didn't you mention like the great wall i mean that seemed like it was a pretty major thing why did why did you forget that and there's a lot of things that he, he left out that you would think he should have included but i mean it was the mongols it wasn't a, a chinese empire at that time so how, how, how did so the the mongol empire didn't last very long it only lasted like 90 years like less than 100 years as as an empire and it, it fell apart but one thing it did do it did unite china i mean if if Mo the mongolian i mean w would the Song and the Jin ever you know resolve their conflict probably not it probably would have been divided to this day which may not have been a bad thing right they could have they're they're like two two separate types of you know land masses but what happened was the same thing that happened in Europe was the Great Plague, right? Remember the the dark, the dark, the, the what does it call it? The Black Plague, the the, the bubonic plague. Mm -hmm. That wasn't just in Europe; it was happening in China too. And unfortunately, so with the Black Plague happened in China, it was destroying fifty percent of the people. And by this time, it wasn't Kublai Khan; it was born. It was his like his grandson or something taken over who had no clue about what to do about what do you there was no school right to go when you're an emperor and there's a great plague this is what you do right he had no clue what to do and when all of these people died you know it's it's a vast agriculture there were there was there was uh agriculture and there was they had to keep the the rivers had to be maintained right so when the people died no one was maintaining the the, the dikes to keep the rivers and the banks and the the um, agriculture, the, the the canals, all of that went into disuse, and everybody was dying, and nobody was doing anything about it. Um, yeah, so I think it, that we 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 should be keeping a scorecard. Mongols good, Mongols bad, because we are going to keep coming back to this question of what would the world be like if there had been no Mongols? And I think that as we move on through the, the final series, when, you know, the, they go west and Persian and Persian and Turkish and all that, it'll become pretty clear the scorecard starts leaning towards they were probably a net negative 
Um, but we're not going to make that choice for you. You get to decide. Um, so we don't want to go too far because we don't want to talk about the Persian stuff because that's yeah, be yeah, separate. yeah. So we can we can wrap up this. The uh, it's called the UN. The Urin, he called it. So he tried to become sanitized. He, he calls this is a dynasty. We have the mandate of heaven, right? We, we create this system, right? With these Europeans somehow interspersed as a layer, like a layer cake between us and the Chinese, right? Uh, but he actually tried to to create a working bureaucracy, right? The problem was it didn't take. And one of the things is he didn't engage the Chinese soon enough. Right to actually run their own run their own country, they tried to do it through this outsourcing, and that, that that wasn't working because Marco Polo and people like him didn't speak the languages he was he was supposed to be controlling. Um, but one thing that happened because the the Chinese themselves, the literati, were not part of the gears of government, um, they actually and and they were ignored, basically. Uh, they created, they had more artistic freedom than they ever had before, right? So they could actually create where they weren't, they, they weren't allowed to participate in government or, or politics. They spent all their time creating plays, creating art, creating, so there's a lot, it was a big creative um, opportunity for the Chinese literati, literati to do something besides do what they were supposed to do, which is to administrate to be the administrators of the great this great empire, be part of the bureaucracy, they were denied that being part of the bureaucracy, and they actually turned that energy. They say that that was the time in China where artists actually had their most freedom to create because they were being ignored and they had no other responsibility. Yeah, it was probably a really um, interesting time be because of all that. Um, so this is a fascinating story, and it's going to continue. Um, what you don't want to miss is um, the episode where the Mongols go um, to Persia, um, specifically because of our guest um, Ali from New Zealand. He's a young man who just has an incredible amount of knowledge. We met him to, you know, help us with some of the, the Muslim and Persian stuff, but it turns out um, he knows about China. He knows about um, the Roman Empire, and it's like, whoa, this this young man really is um, really knowledgeable. Yeah, so, yeah. the um, if I can sum it up real quick here, can I can I sum up the very end of the empire? Because when everything was going to pot, right, mainly caused by the Black Plague and everything that was associated with that, the breakdown of and the, the literati and the leaders were like didn't want to get sick. They 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 left. They were hiding out. Uh, the peasants. And the Buddhists, the Buddhist monasteries was the only, sort of like the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, that was the only form of civilization that was left, right? So they actually supplied some type of order, right? And there became these, from the peasant uprisings, um, a lot of it was very, what we would consider almost like Christian, it was a, there was a Buddhist version of Christian um apocalypticism they felt not jesus was going to come back but buddha was going to come back right he was going to usher in a thousand years of peace and then he was going to buddha was going to kick out the muslims and he was going to the lowly the lowly would be right rose up and the guy this guy this one peasant called chu wong chang which is kind of like lu bang from the han dynasty he actually got into this group of the red turbans right and when he got the control of it, he said, well, you know, maybe let's 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 sort of scale back the end of the world shit and let's just try to unite China. And he did. And he got an army and he was gonna go up to Peijing and kick out the Muslims. I mean the Muslims <laughs> kick out the Mongols. And by this point, the Mongols were going, this whole place is this is this is a mess. This is chaos. And we don't want to be emperors anymore. And they got on their ponies and they went back up to Mongolia. And so by the time uh, Chu Yuan Chang got up to Peijing, it was empty. 
and he just went in and set, set up the the next the next dynasty, which was the Ming Dynasty. So he got the Mongols out of China with, without a fight, as a matter of fact. So and that's and that's the end of the of the of the Yuan and the beginning of the Ming. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much for for throwing that last part in because that that is important. Um, so I want everybody to just take a moment. And be sure if you haven't watched our animation on the Mongols, do that because that's funny. It's just a little fun thing. And also, if you haven't hit subscribe, go ahead and do that now. And we'll be back soon. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you all. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye. Bye.